Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are we all today? Second day of the conference is exciting, right? Did you have a good day yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Good. All right. Uh, yeah, my name is James Tickham. Uh, I have been in PHP since uh, about 2002 um, and programming since before that in various forms. Uh, I'm a Zen certified engineer. Um, uh, they just recently updated it to 7.1 version of PHP, which is kind of cool. Um, I uh, helped run the PHP Hatch user group, which I founded um, some years ago, uh, which is uh, exciting and then, uh, allowed me to meet lots of cool people. And um, also running a conference where I live uh, called PHP South Coast, uh, which is in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I am the lead developer on various open source projects. Uh, I'm a contributor to many more because um, you know I don't like free time. <laughs> um, and uh, my day job, well, I'm a consultant engineer at Rope, so we help fix broken projects. Um, uh, we can do training, consulting, and things like that. Anyway, we're here to learn about uh, Send Expressive. If I turn this on, it will work. There we go. So, uh, what is Zend Expressive, right? Um, first, I'm going to give you an overview of the various layers. Um, and it looks like there's a lot going on underneath. Um, but in actual fact, each block is quite simple. Um, at the bottom, we've got a PSR7 interface. The Actorus uh, is another package, which is an implementation of that. Strategility, which is a middleware piping library. Expressive itself which is bindings for strategy, a router, uh, defense injection, and optionally templating. And your application sits on top of this stack. That's okay, I'll go through it. <laughs> First up, um, PSR7. Uh, who has not heard of PSR7? A couple of hands, okay. Um, so uh, PSR7 is, a, uh, is from the Framework Interoperability Group. It's basically a, a group of people that try and sort of standardize the way we do things in PHP. Um, and this particular uh, standard or spec, whatever you want to call it, um, or recommendation, uh, is about HTTP messages and basically modeling requests and response um, uh, in HTTP. And that's pretty much the foundation of the web right, so it's kind of an important one. So, you know, we've seen HTTP requests, it's got a verb, a request page, a uh, version, a bunch of headers, and then potentially some content, depending on what you're doing. And then you get a response back. It's got a status code, the version of things, some headers, and potentially some response body. And PSR7 just attempts to model that in an interface, or a couple of interfaces. And that's all that is. So, the part that sits on top of that is where we start getting some actual code going on. Um, and this package is called Dioctorus. Um, it's a funny sounding name, but it's a, a, a Greek word for something or other. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what happened there. Uh, but anyway, it's, a, it's an implementation of these interfaces that I mentioned. Right? Um, so it implements uh, an immutable version of request and response. Um, basically, that means it can't change once you've created it. So if you want to make a change, you create a new request and response uh, with a modification. Um, it also handles serialization um, of uh, you know, turn a string uh, into a request and response object and vice versa, which is nice. Um, and it also handles sort of the core part of stream handling, because the body in a request and response is a stream rather than just a block of text for various reasons. I won't go into that. Um, it also has a, a URI implementation. Uh, they're kind of important um, for request and response, uh, requests, certainly. Um, and also the uh, ability to dispatch a very basic request to a callable function. Kind of similar to Node's uh, HTTP server, the basic one that looks something like this. So although it does have this, um, which can you know, accept requests, it's uh, not really useful by itself. Um, and also the execution model in PHP versus uh, something like Node, where this you'll see this quite a lot in you know, basic tutorials for Node's HTTP servers. Um, you know, the execution model is very different. Uh, PHP runs uh, on the SAPI, shared nothing, so it'll tear down and rebuild everything each request. 
Uh, whereas no, just sits there dealing with each individual uh, request. And I think someone's uh, uh, during residences talk yesterday asked, you know, what about making PHP into more of an application server uh, like that? See, that's probably not going to happen. Um, so strategy is the next part. Um, uh, another kind of fun name. Uh, Clearly, Zen loved the name Agility so much that they kind of carried on the theme there. Um, but anyway, this is a, a kind of a library here for creating and dispatching middleware pipelines. It's built to rely on PSR uh, 7 implementation. Um, so in theory, anything should work with it. But we'll stick with the Zen components here um, because it makes sense, right? So what is middleware? Right? Let's have a quick look. Um, it's basically um, sort of just an invocable class. Um, it takes a res uh, request and uh, we've got a response delegator. Previously, you might have seen previous versions of middleware that have got a request to response and the, the next middleware as the third parameter. Um, so the order of events is we perform some kind of an action and then you can pass the request to the delegate, which is basically the next middleware of the chain, the pipe, rather. Um, and this would execute the next middleware, and then it may, in turn, uh, execute another middleware, and so on. Um, and then you can perform some kind of action afterwards and return the response. So there's this package called HTTP intro HTTP middleware. Um, and this is uh, kind of a work in progress for PSR 15, uh, which describes how middleware should, be, uh, should look. Um, and it builds on this PSR 7 spec stuff by defining the structure there. Uh, the package is uh, sort of mostly on par with what's going on in the, in the actual documentation for the PSR. Um, there's like, some naming differences and so on. So technically it's still a moving target, but hopefully um, it's, it's not going to change too much and break things, because we don't like breaking things. Um, this is actually used quite extensively in Express 2, which we'll go into in a moment. Um, but um, if you use middleware already, this kind of makes a bit of a fundamental difference, because as I mentioned, the original style of middleware uh, had a request, a response, and then the next middleware to call. Um, but the response is missing here. We've only got request and the next middleware, and we return the response. Um, and the reason why this has changed is because if you modify the response before passing down the middleware chain, pipe, you say chain, I mean pipe, uh, the next middleware might return a completely new response. And so the response modification you did in earlier on disappears. Right? And that can lead to some weird, like, well, I set this header or whatever, why isn't it being uh, returned in my response? So, um, by removing the response from the, the method signature here, uh, we avoid that problem. Uh, so PSR 15 has adopted this, uh, uh, this shorter signature, and you must always return the response, or, or return a new response. Right? Um, so if you want to change something, you change it on the way out. So after the process, you've got a response there, great, and then you can modify it. OK. So middleware is all about piping stuff. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you're saying, this is a list of the middlewares that I want to do. Right? And this is all in strategy list. You haven't even touched expressive yet. Right? Um, and strategility descends through this middleware pipe um, and it provides a delegate for you um, that handles calling the next middleware for you, which is nice, right? So for example, um, we might have a log all errors caught middleware because we want to do some kind of special logging, perhaps. Um, so we can wrap the delegate call and try catch and it will catch all throw calls, for example. If uh, an exception happens, maybe we want to return a JSON response with a 500 error, or maybe we just want to uh, log into a log server, or you know, whatever you want to do, right? But the point is, everything inside that delegate call, so basically any middleware further down the pipe, um, if any exceptions is thrown, we'll catch it there. 
So the next one uh, in my example might be a session initializing the middleware. Uh, it's a very simple one. Uh, before we continue down the middleware pipe, we call session start. Pretty much a no-brainer, right? Authentication middleware. Um, Maybe we've got some kind of uh, authentication required here, um, some OAuth or whatever, if we're doing an API perhaps. Um, and we can check that using the information stored within the request. Um, if it's valid, maybe you want to return a 403 or, or yeah, an adjacent response. And the nice thing here is um, if you follow the logic through, uh, we never actually call delegate process to execute the next middleware. So we're short circuiting that whole pipe. If they're not authenticated, we don't want to continue the execution, just return the response straight away. Uh, now obviously, if you, obviously if you are authenticated, it will continue, it will call delegate process and will continue execution. Um, so quite often you'll see that actions are um, sort of in a separate folder and, and, and projects and, and layouts and so on. Uh, but at the end of the day, an action is just another middleware. Um, if you're not familiar with these kind of middleware style applications, uh, think of it as a controller, but only one action in that controller. Okay? Um, and you'll notice here that the delegate is never called because well, there's nothing else that we care about further down the chain. Instead, we form a response directly, and that might be uh, rendering a template, it might be returning some JSON, uh, whatever you want to do really, whatever you normally do in a controller action. Right. So, expressive mode. Well, we kind of talked a lot about middleware and uh, that's kind of the foundation of expressive, but ex expressive itself is just a glue that binds everything together, right? It uses that PSR7 implementation, the Actorus. It creates the middleware pipes using the functionality exposed by Strategility. But it also adds uh, routing capabilities um, using a router of your choice. It creates services um, using a DI container and dispatches the requests and so on. And optionally handles templating and optionally handling error and so on. So routing. Um, as I said, it can, you can use a router of your choice. You can use Aura router, a Kita Popos fast router, a uh, fast router rather, uh, or you can use Zerf's MVC router or Zen router rather. Um, my personal preference is uh, fast route because it's fast. <laughs> um, and you can do services as well using a container interop compatible uh, container. Um, which is finally a, a spec in the big stuff. Um, but for example, you could use a service manager, um, you could use Aura DI, Pimple, um, or in theory, as long as you kind of create the glue in for that, uh, anything with a supports container in shop. My personal preference is uh, Zen service manager. I just find the configuration and huge amounts of arrays quite nice. Um, and I said optionally templating uh, quite a few times. And it's optional because you don't need necessarily need templating. Like if you're writing an API that returns JSON or XML, you don't need templating. So Express doesn't make you use that. It just offers it up as an option. So all the supported out box, Zen View, Plates, and Tweak. Um, my personal favorite is Zen View because I like having to explicitly escape out of it all the time. So, um, Expressive has two places that it can plug in middleware, right? You can do uh, piping middleware, uh, like we've kind of seen already. These are essentially like always on middlewares. And this is basically what Strategility handles, right? And this is the main life cycle of the application execution. Um, it's useful for uh, logging requests, perhaps error handling, uh, global authentication authorization, things like that. Uh, and of course, triggering the routing and dispatching parts of uh, Expressive. Uh, and you can also add middlewares to specific routes. 
um, which is nice. Uh, you can um, add multiple middlewares to a route. Uh, so maybe you only want to protect certain uh, actions uh, with authorization, authentication, whatever. Um, so you can do that on specific, specific routes if you like. Uh, and you can also run middleware on specific HTTP verbs as well, which is uh, uh, kind of useful if you're doing a REST API. <coughs> so, what about Zen two and three? Um, it's expressive is not designed to be a replacement for these; purely an alternative. Um, who has used Zen framework before? Okay, a lot of you. Okay. So that's good, you'll be kind of familiar with the things I mentioned, because basically, instead of focusing on the main four components, I guess, of Zen Framework 2 and 3 is the MVC package, Module Manager, Event Manager, and Service Manager, and they kind of play nicely together. Um, and it's just a different paradigm. Zen MVC is still driven by events. You know, nothing's changed there. Uh, I mean, there's new versions and so on, but uh, uh, you know, it's still essentially that MVC architecture, and it's still a viable option for applications. And I guess it depends maybe on the use case, maybe on just preference. Um, like maybe a team gets together and say, oh, let's use middleware, it's because they're cool. Um, so yeah, if you are familiar with Zen Framework, you need to kind of mind shift about how uh, your application executes. Because although you can um, just say, well, I'm going to create one action and, and that's it. You're not really leveraging the power of middlewares there. Um, obviously in Zen Framework you can use the event manager a lot um, to plug things in and you know listen for specific events and so on. Um, and you also get the power of this module merging stuff, right? Um, that configuration merging from you know, third party components and so on is pretty powerful, but you need to handle this explicitly. Uh, inexpressive. There are ways of doing it, which is kind of neat, and uh, there's a cookbook on the expressive the documentation that shows you how you can make a module uh, for an expressive application. So, kind of a fun thing to do is to use the Zen framework components in expressive. Um, now, you can do this. Uh, it's not quite as straightforward because you've got no module manager. Um, so there's no module.php, um, but the nice thing is anything that module.php does, as long as it does just this including the config, um, it is actually quite straightforward. So we have this concept called the config provider. And basically, it's just a class that returns an array, because we like arrays. Um, it simply moves the module.config that you may be familiar with in Zen Framework 2, which is the, just a, an array of configuration, and it moves it into this callable object. The advantage to doing this is that instead of specifying a path to a config file like we did there, um, you can use autoloading, which is really nice. Um, and Zen Framework has adap adapted many, mod many, many of their own modules to use this concept. And that actually makes the config much more reusable. So you simply just call invoke or invoke the class because it's a callable object. And that will return the config that we used to. And also Expressive uses a similar style of array configuration. Um, so looking at the get dependency config, for example, uh, we can see it's the same as what we used to, right? Um, there's not a lot different, but it's just that more portable way of doing it. You can use the auto-loading to find the configuration for you. Having a look at Zenforms module.php, the, the, the Zenform module.php module uh, uses the config provider itself. Um, you need to uh, assign uh, the correct uh, uh, array key uh, in uh, Zen framework is called Service Manager. I think that's actually changed. Um, uh, but you just call it right? Um, and you can reuse these inexpressive applications. You simply create a config file 
maybe call it Zen form dot global dot php, and you can invoke that config provider, and it returns the contents, and it's all just there as you configured. And it you, it can allow you to import the most standard Zen framework components into Expressive. Um, your mileage may vary, um, but if the module dot php does does anything more than that, then you're going to need to replicate that functionality somehow. That's a kind of a bootstrap code. So right, your application, that's what sits on top of this, and this is what we're actually interested in. Um, I have some source code on GitHub, which uh, I use throughout this presentation. Uh, if you have a laptop and you'd like to follow along, um, please do. Uh, I will, of course, put the slides on, uh, on joined in uh, afterwards, uh, so that you can check out this code and see how it all works. It's just a demo repository, but I'll use examples from this from now on. Um, so the Express, Express Skeleton application is by far the easiest way to get up and running, and you can literally get up and running in minutes. It's really easy to do. It uses a CLI tool uh, to configure everything. You just choose some options, right? Um, so you use Composer, Composer Create Project, put in the Skeleton uh, application URL, give it a name, and then it will say, well, um, do you want to do a minimal or full install? Uh, you usually want to just do a full install because otherwise you have to sort everything out manually yourself, but it depends on what you're trying to do. But if you're just getting started, do the full install, right? It'll be easier. Um, it will ask you what router you want to use. So like I said, it will give you a, a multiple choice. I opted for fast route because fast. You'll be asked what container to use by Altid for Zen Service Manager. Um, and what templating engine uh, to use, I chose none because I'm running an API. And finally, it asks you whether you want to install whoops. Um, if you don't want whoops, it's you know, fancy error handling stuff. Uh, I didn't choose that for whatever reason. And then it will go off to Composer install, all of the dependencies that you've chosen. Um, and you can use the command compose to serve to test if it works. And all being well, if you navigate to HTTP local code on 8080, you will see uh, a response that looks like that. Hey, and that is as quick as it, it, it takes to set up the framework. From then on, you can start writing your actual application. So let's do that, right? Um, so the application I'm writing here um, is going to be very simple. Uh, I'm going to have a book entity, which we'll go into in a bit more detail, um, an, an interface for finding books, and two endpoints, one to check in a book, and one to check out a book. It's kind of like a library, right? That's what we do. So the book entity. I'm going to make it very simple. Um, the ID here is a UUID. Um, I used Ben Ramsey's UUID library here. Uh, this just has a single property. Actually, the real application has two properties. It has a name and whether it's in stock or not. So we've only got one of each book. I'm just keeping it simple for demonstration. Right? In a real library, we probably have more than one of each book, perhaps. Um, and we've got a method that we're going to write. It. We're going to keep it very simple. Um, we're going to say, well, if we uh, don't have this book in stock for an exception. Otherwise, we'll just say well, it's no longer in stock. Check in method, exactly the opposite. Uh, if it's already in stock, throw it an exception. Uh, and if not, mark it as being in stock again. And that's a very, very straightforward uh, business logic here. Also, writing an interface here to find a book via UID. Well, this will come into play a bit later. Um, but for now, we'll just say this is. Uh, something that will find the book, you know. Uh, I like naming things uh, descriptively. Uh, and it takes a UID and returns a book entity. That's the whole point. If it fails, it should throw an exception. So apologies if you can't read that. It's a little, maybe a little bit small. But um, uh, the action here, uh, it implements the uh, uh, middleware interface from ACCP interop as we HTTP messages, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, but there's basically three steps, right? Um, there's a lot of exception catching, catching and so on, because we like to give useful feedback to the API consumer. 
Um, find a bit where UID does what it says on the tin, uh, and then we call checkout, and then we return a JSON response. That's all we want to do. Um, and the check-in action is essentially the same. So before we go any further, I'm going to just talk uh, uh, is anyone actually used Expressive before? Okay, a few people. Um, so in Expressive previously, uh, previous version two, version two, um, you would use just config to create the pipeline. So you would define an array of middleware, uh, as shown here, um, and Expressive will look that up in your chosen uh, container on interrupt compatible service container. Uh, and you also add in the special uh, routing middleware and dispatch middleware um, where you want them in the pipe. Um, but new in Expressive 2 and sort of going forward, um, this is probably the preferred, uh, or probably most likely the preferred uh, way of doing it, is simply just calling pipe programmatically. I mean, that's, that's why it's called the programmatic pipeline. Um, and it's almost the same as before. You pass in the service uh, name, so we'll look it up in the container. Um, and instead of those magic constants, we just call pipe routing middleware and pipe dispatch middleware where, where we want to in the chain. So I mean, these two provide exactly the same functionality, right? Flip between them, uh, they will be the same. Um, the advantages to this is, well, your middleware pipe rarely changes, right? Uh, it's pretty much static stuff. In configuration, the configuration has to be parsed every time, and it just calls this under the, underneath anyway. Um, so we're just cutting out a step there, so maybe a micro optimization. Whatever. And it's also kind of less verbose and kind of more obvious about what's going on. And it also matches the style of other frameworks like Slim. Um, it's kind of nice though because you can, at least for now, combine the approaches. Uh, it's just especially useful if you have a config provider. Uh, so maybe we've written book root config provider and that has a couple of routes in the check in and check out one perhaps. Um, and it can return that root in config. And then you can call inject routes from config uh, with the provider as the argument or uh, sorry, executing the provider as an argument or just an array, if you like array. Um, and it also has inject pipeline from config as well, so you can do the same thing with the middleware pipes. But um, it can make things a bit tricky with ordering. Um, so uh, you can see here in the config style, we've actually got a priority thing, um, which is useful if you're just doing all config-driven uh, uh, pipelines and routes, but it kind of gets a bit messy because it depends where you inject that um, in the process, right? It's not advised to use both approaches, really, so pick one and stick with it, um, and the one you probably want to pick is the programmatic one because the config one will eventually go away. Uh, we don't know when yet, but um, yeah. Go with the programmatic pipelines, and it will be the default uh, going forward. Right, so we talked a lot about expressive talks, about, about expressive and doctrine. Um, we can start getting the database involved. Now, I'm not going to talk about the ODM uh, or MongoDB stuff, right, because it's out, it's out of the scope of this talk. Um, who has not used an ORM before? Raise your hands. All used ORMs, cool. Who's not used doctrine before? Okay, a couple. So, a very quick overview. Um, doctrine itself uh, is actually several components. The main part is the, the DVAL database abstraction layer. It allows it to talk to many different databases. And then the ORM, or Object Relationship Mapper, sits on top of that. Your application houses entities, and the entities contain your business logic. They're plain, not PHP objects, which is very nice and doctrine through some magic wizardry, which you don't want to know how it works, tracks the changes to these entities. Um, it will, uh, and then you do this process called the flush, which is nothing to do with toilets, it's to do with 
through putting your stuff into the database for persistence. Um, your application should have things like finders, services, whatever you want to call it, but basically a way of finding stuff from, uh, from the database, or from the doctrine rather. Um, these would use something called an entity manager, which is some black magic that you don't want to look at, uh, and that would fetch these populated entities and it magically hydrates all the data from the database. Uh, an example of this, funnily enough, is find by a new UID interface. So Doctrine RO module, if I was writing as a two or three app, I would probably go straight for this. Um, uh, and well, why wouldn't I use Doctrine RO directly? It kind of has some nice advantages in the Z of 2 or 3 app. Uh, it's already got the wired-in configuration, which is nice. You can get up and running uh, easily without fiddling around with the rays. Um, and it's also got the configured services in the service manager. It's got CLI tools all ready to use and a bit of doctrine module. Um, and if you use it, you've got ZDT, ZDT, whatever you want to call it, Zen Development Tools integration. Uh, it also has Zen Form integration. Kind of nice, kind of nice. Um, and surprisingly, has reasonable documentation. Reasonable documentation, yeah. So, what about putting it into Expressive, right? Because they kind of, I've mentioned you can kind of use some of these modules in an Expressive application. Um, yeah, we don't have the module manager, so how do we do this? Um, yeah, the automatic configuration that we like in Zen Framework 3 is there. So you have to manually wire it up, like something like this uh, that we put in an application before. And it basically pulls in the configuration parts, the module, dot configs, and so on. And that only works because the module.php doesn't do anything useful that we're interested in in this case. You also need to manually configure the CLI stuff. But the advantage of using this is you get things like the hydration and the form and so on, as I've mentioned. So well, why isn't there config providers? Well, uh, there will be eventually, because I've created pull requests to both Doctrine RM module and Doctrine module, which haven't emerged yet, which turn everything into a config provider. But we'll see. Um, but wait, container interrupt Doctrine is uh, uh, a package that's in development. Ben Scholzen or Dasprit, you may have heard of uh, him before if you uh, uh, have used uh, uh, Zen Bruto, he wrote most of that. Um, this package isn't actually specific to Expressive. It's actually specific, funnily enough, to container and uh, So it doesn't need to be used just in Expressive. You can start using this anywhere. You have a container. And this package is basically just a bunch of factories that automatically configure what we like. Um, you compose a real high for container and doctrine. If it doesn't, or if you don't already have Doctrine as a dependency, it will add it, so you don't need to do anything else but include this one. Um, and you need to create a configuration file, of course, um, and you simply wire up uh, that single factory, uh, entity, ma uh, entity Manager Factory, um, with Entity Manager Interface as the service name. Um, and that's pretty much all you have to do is just kind of nice to get things up and running. Uh, this works fine if you have our own default namespace, which in most cases is fine. Uh, it does work if you have multiple configurations. <coughs> you just check the documentation if you do weird things like that. So obviously we need to tell it how to connect to the database with the credentials and all that, so we create a configuration file for that. I'm using Postgres for this library, um, but because we're using the debal, anything should work, kind of. Um, and there are some exa useful examples concerning configurations uh, in the repository, so do check them out. Hopefully it goes without saying, but it would be irresponsible of me uh, if I didn't mention the connection URL here. Don't save your passwords in your Git repository. Um, Expressive allows you to create uh, files that end in local.php, which are by default git ignored, uh, especially if you use the uh, Expressive Skeleton application. So put the real passwords and things in there, don't commit it. Um, you can see how I've done this in the client application. 
So you probably want to use the CLI tools too, uh, so you can create your CLI config. Uh, very easily, you can just grab the container, require container.php, that's the default setup. Um, and you create the helper set and so on for that, and that will make all the CLI stuff work nicely. So, annotating the entities. Remember that entities are plain old PHP objects. So we use these things called annotations um, to tell Doctrine how to add to the database. All these are is just comments with specific syntax. Um, annotations are cached, uh, so you don't have to worry too much about performance stuff there. Um, you can also use XML or if you like pain, um, YAML, but that's also going away, so just don't use YAML. Um, so we can add these an uh, annotations to the book entity. So up here, for example, we've got a table name, book. Uh, we've got uh, our ID column. Um, yeah. And uh, so each column has some annotations that tells Doctrine how to map these into the database. Uh, the uh, ORM ID annotations tells Doctrine that it's the primary key um, and the type is GUID. Um, the type is mapped internally by Doctrine Dewell to a real database type, uh, which obviously depends on the database you're using as the point of the Dewell, right? Um, in this case, uh, maybe Postgres it will use a UUID type, uh, maybe in something like IBM DB2 it will use a char 36. Um, but also note here that we're using, not using uh, an auto generation strategy. Uh, basically, that's the auto increment stuff. So we're turning that off because it's the UID can't auto increment. Um, there is also a library um, from Ben Ramsey as well called UUID Doctrine. You can actually use that, yeah, but um, that may make that slightly different and sort out mappings potentially. <coughs> so remember back in the action, we had that find book by UUID interface. We can implement that now. This, uh, the class constructor might take an object repository, which is basically where you fetch objects from, um, populated objects, if you like. Um, and we're just going to call uh, find on there, because we can find by the ID, and so that's the, the easy method that we can use there. And that will return our book entity populated with all the database values. Cool, that's pretty easy. If the book isn't found, it returns null. Um, but our interface that we wrote, although it, you could go, and have it, go ahead and ignore the comment that, that it expects to throw an exception, um, we're going to go and um, do as we told, and we turn that into a noisy exception if we can't find the book, because we have all that in the action, right? So finally, we can update those actions to actually perform this. And we're going to run the checkout and check in in uh, transaction. Um, uh, this is kind of a really academic and uh, overcomplicated example because in this case there is only one database operation so you don't need to be done in the transaction. But it's kind of nice to see how this works. Um, so when you have an atomic operation, multiple database things, use a transaction. So you call this uh, transactional function, you pass it a, a closure. Um, and what it will do is, is it will begin the transaction in the database, it will run the code in the callable, um, and then it will call flush at the end, um, and then the transaction, right? Uh, if any exceptions occur in that, it will roll back, hence why it's a transaction, right? In real terms here, all, all we're doing is taking advantage of the, the, the fact it will automatically flush. So in a more practical use case, you know, the atomic, atomicity is good, um, uh, but yeah, it can be good to get into the habit of using properly demonstrated transactions. So handily, we set up the CLI configuration. Cool. So we can run this uh, handy CLI tool, uh, ORM schema tool create. That examines the entities that you've defined and creates all the database schema for you, which is cool. If you already have an existing schema and you want to start using Doctrine, there are also tools to go the other way so it can generate your entities from the database. You probably have to manually tweak them there. Um, Inserting some data, uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. We need a book so we can check in and out. 
Uh, but now, if you visit the checkout URL, you should see something like this JSON response. You've checked out the Great Escape. Um, and similarly, if you do the check-in, we can see we checked in the book. And if you try and try and do either of those operations twice in a row, the second time it will fail. Hopefully, you've done it right. So let's have a look at some more examples of middleware and how we can sort of leverage this middleware stuff. Flushing, as I mentioned, is a key part of the ORM process. Without it, nothing actually persists to the database ever. So let's like write a really dumb middleware that just flushes everything at the end of a request. Um, this is not actually useful in this particular application because uh, we're using the transactional stuff there, but maybe you do want to use this. So we can look with something like this, a flushing middleware. Um, and we can say, uh, if the entity manager is open, um, then we flush it, and that's pretty much it. It's the same sort of thing we've seen before. But I do want to point out something. Um, because I'm using the old style middleware here, so we've got request, response, and um, uh, the next middleware to be called, um, it's a good practice because um, the next uh, middleware could be null. Because we depend on that, uh, middleware, the next middleware to be there, you have to check explicitly. So that's kind of where the, the new uh, request and delegate interface signature uh, uh, is very useful because it can't be null. You can't pass nothing to it, so you can always be guaranteed. So it kind of, you would get rid of that check. And in the real code that I've got on GitHub for this library, uh, you'll see that I'm using the, the, the new style middleware because it's much better, I think. Um, right, yeah, after that, obviously, we, uh, uh, we dispatch the next middleware, um, and we say, oh, if, uh, if the entity manager is open, or flushed, or change the database, you've not used Doctrine before. Um, basically, if an exception is thrown by the database, in some particular case, the entity manager becomes closed. Um, at this point, it's basically saying, don't connect to the database again, don't do anything in the database again. You need to tidy up and run away because something's broken. Um, and finally, return the response back up to the chain. Woo. So now we've got a pretty good functioning application. So far, we've set up an expressive uh, application using the skeleton. That was quick and easy. We've created some endpoints. We've uh, integrated Doctrine using container into our Doctrine um, and sort of leveraged a bit of the automatic flushing middleware functionality there. So let's add some authentication. Uh, you know, normally with an API, you might like to go with an OAuth or something like that. Um, but we're going to keep our API really secure using a magic query string. Um, just for example's sake, it's right, really simple authentication. Don't do this at home. Um, so our actual authentication is just saying if the, word, uh, if the query string has authenticated equals one in it. Um, and if we fail the authentication, we're going to return a JSON response. And as I we kind of went through earlier, this will short circuit everything and return back up the middleware pipeline straight away. Uh, if we do pass the authentication, we're going to execute next, pass it along the request, uh, and um, response. It's using the old style middleware. I should update this slide. So there's also this package called, um, again, from, from Ben Scholz, and uh, it's a package called Helios. Um, it uses JWT to store authentication without a server-side session, which is kind of nice. Um, and you implement authentication lookups via uh, middleware. Uh, you register a thing called an identity lookup interface, which is, funnily enough, something that looks up identities, for example, in the, in the doctrine repository, and returns it. Um, you register the identity middleware into the pipeline, uh, just like any other, uh, any other middleware. Um, and this would inject the authenticated user into the request, ob uh, request object, which is nice. And we'll see in what I mean by that in a moment. Um, and you can also specify the sign-in, sign-out actions, and so on. And it uses the cookie manager to inject and expire, expire authentication, and so on. It's kind of a nice little, little library. 
There's also what we call PSR 7 session, um, which, funny enough, it works with PSR stuff, uh, PSR 7 stuff, rather. Uh, and it's a session container that doesn't use server-side storage. Um, like Helios, it uses JWT to store the data in a cookie rather than in session. Um, it's HTTPS only, which is a secure default. You can turn that off, uh, but it's not recommended unless you're doing something using the PHP's built-in web server for testing, uh, which we'll see in a moment. Um, and it provides a PSR7 middleware to do everything to do with storing and uh, retrieving a session, which is nice. So I'm going to use it to add a counter to our responses, which is pointless for our application because an API usually doesn't carry state across in, co in, in cookies. Some of them do, but yeah, we'll see. Um, so you would specify a factory, you create a factory with lots of code. Um, Basically, this is uh, copy and paste it from the repository with just a load of default options, which are you know a sane default. Um, there are examples of documentation about what all this stuff is. Uh, we can sort of click through and figure out for yourself if you like. And just note that I've created the cookie with with secure. It's false because I'm running the PHP intern a built-in web server. Um, and also note that this metric key shouldn't be hard-coded like it is there. Um, grab it from a config in the container um, and uh, put that, don't commit that into your repository. So once the service is registered in the container, you can uh, add it into the middleware pipeline, just like before, using the config style uh, 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 here. Um, and the middleware will automatically add a session container into your request objects. So it's kind of nice in your middleware further down, you can get do request get attribute with uh, this uh, magic constant key. Um, and once we have that container, we can get set, uh, remove stuff, and, and, and things like that. Just, right? It's just a normal container, right? And that is your session, which is kind of nice, and it does all that magically for you. So, to summarize, PSR7 kind of kick this all off. This is the foundation of this, um, which has uh, been adopted uh, in many places and is, is a good thing, right? Deactorus is just a PSR7 implementation. Um, I don't know, maybe others exist, possibly. Stratagility is uh, a middleware pipeline, and that's actually the, the main part of an expressive application. It's just those middleware pipelines and executing stuff. Expressive is the glue that kind of makes, kind of brings everything together um, and makes it easier for you. The doctrine module can be used with a bit of fiddling, but you probably want to use container and drop doctrine because it makes things work uh, much nicer. And it'll wear all the things, right? Okay, uh, there's some references for your slides. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, I'm not as the chair of the microphone. <laughs> I've noticed that you uh, use uh, annotations in your doctrine configuration, and I know that doctrine uh, has three types of possible configurations in the YML, in the XML, and in the annotations, of course, yeah. uh, which is from Symphony. Uh, my question is actually do you have? Uh, a possibility in Zen Expresso to use the configuration for doctrine in a single file, like why, why now? Um, what to configure doctrine itself? Uh, to configure entities. Um, well, uh, yeah, you, in your doctrine configuration, um, uh, okay. um, in this doctrine configuration, this is where you set up all your annotation driver and things like, things like that. So yes, instead of the annotation driver, you can set it up to use the XML driver or the Apple driver if you like pain. Um, and you'll see specify where those configuration files are there. So it's it's like, it, this is the standard sort of doctrine configuration stuff. Um, it, it, it passes it straight into 
doctrine itself. It's just the factories kind of pick up on that and, and sort that configuration out for you. That's the point of the, the container interrupt doctrine package um, to do that for you. Yeah? Thank you. Any more questions? So, in, in this example, if you want to put the user in the the local file, mm -hmm. do we, how would the local file work? Do we copy the whole local and then change it? Or just change that area? I would basically have just an array with doctrine connection or own default params URL. Um, also, they get merged. Yes. So um, uh, the, the configuration, yeah, if it wasn't, wasn't clear, basically all the configurations get merged together in, in, in an order. Um, so it will use um, anything .global.php first, and then anything .local.php comes in afterwards. So that you know you can override things per environment. Of course, those local properties are never should never be committed. Um, you can provide sort of templates which, for that, which is useful. Um, and you say, "I'll oh, change this value to you know, your real database URL and things like that." Okay. So we have one time for one more question. Okay, let's bring up. I want to ask, um, what do you think the advantage of expressive framework compared to the other existing frameworks? So, is it fitting for certain type of problems? So, yeah, um, I have a great answer for that. Um, except, I like the way you can compose middleware. Like, right? you can um, create a middleware for each atomic operation. Stack and compose those together to create sort of uh, a, a nice execution flow. It's really just a very different paradigm. I think it's a, just a very different way from you know, traditional MPC stuff that you know, Symfony is that framework and, and so on have been using for years. Um, so it's just a different way of thinking about it. I like the fact that everything is all the even all the packages are just composed together nicely you know, you're not forced to use any specific service manager uh, uh, container drop package and things like that so you can have more flexibility and in theory um, you can use a much smaller code base as well because you just use what you need um, and then if you don't need it's not that so you, know, you haven't got a load of dead code lying around um, from you know, maybe you use a, a full framework and there's loads of stuff in there that you don't need, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, I would say if APIs are probably quite a good one, we have to use it as an example here. Um, and we've used it on a few different projects now, various things. Um, but 